Michael was a normal sort of guy who hit a nasty streak of bad luck. He had lost his well-paying job, and when he could no longer bring in the money, his wife left him, took the kids, and filed for divorce. Showing her true colors, she was keeping the kids from him, stating in the divorce papers that he was an alcoholic. He enjoyed one drink of fine scotch after a hard day's work, but her schemes were working like a charm and she was taking everything from him. He had recently lost the house to her and now was getting charged child support and spousal support and was getting behind. Of course, he had attempted to find a new job, but as is common with many aging people in America, him being in his mid-40s, he was having a lot of trouble and found that age discrimination is a real thing. He had, at his dismay, found out that his ex had drained the bank account they shared and he could no longer afford the payments on his Mercedes-Benz GLS SUV that he had been forced to live out of. The repo men were no doubt close on his tail waiting to pounce and take it from him, considering his ex had not been paying the payments for months as she planned to leave him and screwing him out of everything. As luck would have it, one day, as he was returning to his vehicle from searching for a job, they did just that. He was now completely homeless. He had never been in this situation before. He had always been a hard-working guy and thought he could trust his wife completely. He thought she loved him as he did her. Clearly, he either underestimated her or overestimated his worth to her. He had nowhere to go. His own parents had died years ago and he had been an only child growing up poor. So here he was, homeless, cold, and depressed, with nowhere to turn and no one who cared. It, at this point, should be pretty clear that he was severely depressed and was probably contemplating suicide. That was until he met him. He was very well dressed and had a deep, rich voice with a slight British accent. Michael had stumbled upon him in a cemetery one night at about three in the morning. The man had been standing in front of a monument that depicted the Archangel Michael casting down Satan like the painting by Guido Reni. He was silently weeping. Sir, are, are you all right? Michael asked the man. Ah, uh, yes, yes, my friend, I'm fine. Just remembering an old friend from long ago, the man replied. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to intrude, Michael replied and went to turn and leave the man to mourn in peace. Nonsense, you look cold. Would you like to have yourself a bit of scotch from my flask? I could use a bit of company if you don't mind, the man quickly said. Ah, scotch, you say? I haven't had that in ages. Yes, please. My name's Michael, sir. Michael Hamilton, Michael replied with an outstretched hand to shake. The man smiled and grabbed Michael's hand. His hands felt like cold marble and his skin was pale almost a porcelain color that seemed to nearly glow in the winter moonlight. He shook Michael's hand with a solid, firm, but not painful grip and introduced himself. Victim Manamont, it is my sincere pleasure to meet you, Mr. Hamilton, he said with a smile that almost seemed sinister, yet still warm and welcoming at the same time. He handed the flask to Michael, who removed the cap and waved it below his nose, inhaling deep. Ah, it smells glorious, he said as he allowed the scent to consume his senses. It had been so long since he had not only tasted one of his favorite drinks, but also been shown an ounce of kindness by another human being. He took a small but pleasant sip. Is this McAllen? Michael said in shock, not expecting the flavor of his favorite scotch to grace his lips. <laughs> yes, it's fine oak 21 gear to be exact. You certainly know your scotch, my friend, Victor said with a chuckle. Go ahead, drink up, I insist. Michael took another swig, glancing towards the monument before them. So, was this friend of yours put to rest here? Ah, uh, yes, many years ago. He was more of an old adversary, really, Victor said with a chuckle. I never thought I would grow to miss our interactions, but his family and I are still quite familiar with each other. Michael looked over the massive statue before him. It was beautifully crafted in marble. It looked aged, and as he scanned down it, he seen a date and a name. Trindel, 1835, it said, engraved near the base. This puzzled Michael. How in the world could this man, who looks no older than 40, have known someone who died in 1835. 
is this a family tomb or something? It says 1835. He asked Victor, confused. No, this is the final resting place of Thomas Trindell, someone I had known for a very long time, and he was the first in a long line of people I would come to know. But before we continue, I have a proposition for you, my friend. Care to join me at my flat, where we can speak in the warmth of the fireplace? You look absolutely freezing and, dare I say, dreadfully disheveled. Michael agreed and followed the mysterious man intrigued. They soon came upon a white Bentley and was greeted by a driver who opened the doors with a nod. Mr. Manamont, I see you have a guest, sir. Where will you be going? He asked Victor. Home, Herman, he said to the man. The man's eyes grew large for a moment as he glanced over at Michael, but his eyes quickly traveled downward towards the snow-covered ground with a nod as he opened the doors for them. As you say, Mr. Manamont. The drive was very quiet. Victor didn't say much and had a contemplative look on his solid face as they drove onward. He had allowed Michael the rest of the scotch, despite Michael's protest that he simply could not give away such an expensive drink. Victor simply chuckled and said, <laughs> Nonsense, my friend. Money is not a concern of mine. We will talk more once we reach my flat. For now, enjoy the ride and the hospitality I can offer. Michael nodded with a smile and took another swig from the silver flask. Michael didn't quite understand what was going on. Why was this man being so kind to him? He was just some homeless guy wandering aimlessly through a cemetery at night. He had done this countless times before and never ran into a single soul. He would sometimes sleep in the mausoleum they kept open if the weather was bad enough. Perhaps it was fate that had us meet on this night, Mr. Hamilton. Victor said to him as if he was reading Michael's mind. This shocked Michael. How could he have known what he was thinking? Michael shook his head a little. It must be some sort of coincidence, he thought to himself. Well, you certainly are a lifesaver for me, Victor. It's been ages since anyone showed me the slightest bit of compassion. You have restored my faith in humanity. Well, let's not go that far, my friend, Victor replied with a laugh. Michael couldn't help but to laugh as well, now feeling quite drunk from the scotch. They pulled into a walled estate, past a beautiful cast iron gate. Driving up a winding drive, they stopped in front of a large brick home. It was gorgeous and looked very old. It looked to be a Victorian style mansion. The windows were stained glass, though Michael couldn't make out the pictures they were adorned with. The carved pillars on the porch had twisting rope designs reaching towards the top that had gargoyles that were carved from the wood overhanging the porch. The porch was painted black, as were the massive double doors that waited before them. The doors opened, and another man greeted them with a nod and a beckoning motion with his hands as a welcoming gesture. Welcome home, Mr. Manamont. I see we have a guest. I shall notify the kitchen and housekeeping of their arrival, sir, the man said. Yes, thank you. Victor replied with a smile and motioned for Michael to follow him. As they entered the room, the scent of leather and paper filled the air. It was what appeared to be a large library of some sort. It was filled with antique leather-bound books that sat on many hand-carved mahogany bookshelves, all matching. A large fireplace was at the far end of the room, lit with two old antique chairs on either side. Michael followed Victor over where Victor motioned for him to take a seat. He obliged. So, Mr. Hamilton, as I said, I have an offer of sorts for you, Victor said. Yes, you mentioned that. What is this all about? Why invite a homeless man to such a beautiful estate? Michael replied, confused. Well, you see, Mr. Hamilton, it was not by chance that we met tonight. It was by design. I have been watching you closely over the last few months, and I have done my research into you as well," Victor replied. Your research? What the hell are you talking about? Have you been stalking me or something? Michael said with a slightly raised voice, more bewildered than angry. I have been watching you. I know that you lost your executive job with the Bonds Company. I know your wife left you, took your children, and has left you penniless. But I also know that you are a highly intelligent man, who is a hard worker and dedicates himself fully to any task given to him. You have just came upon some horrible luck in your recent past, Victor calmly said. 
That's an understatement, Michael said, looking into the fire. So what's this all about then? I would like to extend to you an invitation to join me here on my estate. Your room and board would be paid for, and you will help me with my endeavors. Paid, of course, Victor said. So you're offering me a job? Oh, that would be amazing, Michael said, his eyes lighting up at the prospect of finally getting back on his feet. Not exactly, Mr. Hamilton. You see, when you mentioned earlier that I had restored your faith in humanity, I laughed because I'm not exactly what you would consider human, Victor said with a slight grin. Michael sat wide-eyed and silent, not knowing how he could possibly reply to such a ludicrous statement. I am what you would consider a vampire. You're a what? Oh, come on, would you expect me to believe that? I'm sorry, Mr. Manama, but I thought you were serious about this job. You have a great night. Michael said bluntly, standing and beginning to head out of the room to leave. Mr. Hamilton, Victor said right before Michael reached the door. What? Michael sighed as he turned to face Victor, who was now standing and holding a knife in his hand. Shall I show you some proof? Victor replied with a smile. At that moment... He raised the knife to his own neck, slitting his throat. The gaping wound sprayed blood across the floor as Michael jumped back in shock and horror. This man had just slit his own throat in front of him. As Michael looked on, Victor tossed the knife to the floor and grabbed both the bottom and top of the wide cut and ripped it open further, exposing his larynx and muscles. Blood was all over the front of him and continued to pour from the slit. Victor never once broke his smile. What the fuck are you doing? screamed Michael. Victor then let go of the wound, and it began to heal up right before Michael's eyes, sealing up and leaving no trace save for the blood that now covered Victor and the carpet below him. Why don't you take the night to sleep on it before you decide, Michael? Victor said, still grinning. <laughs>